Today on Earth Focus, for the U.S. military, going green may not be an option. It may be a matter of national security. We have a report. We'll see how Obama campaign strategists share their internet savvy with youth climate activists. In Bangladesh, leather tanning threatens health. Ecologist TV investigates. And Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson speaks with British author Rose George about her new book, The Big Necessity, The Unmentionable World of Human Waste and Why It Matters. All coming up on Earth Focus. When it comes to the future of America's defense, it cannot be business as usual. A new report says that depending on fossil fuel to defend the United States makes the nation vulnerable and that the Department of Defense can lead the way to promote energy independence and efficiency through innovation and the development of new technologies. The report, Powering America's Defense, Energy and the Risks to National Security, was prepared by 12 retired admirals and generals and issued by CNA, a Virginia-based research group. It was presented at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. in May 2009. It sounds a clear warning that our energy security, climate security, and our national security, militarily, politically, and economically, are inextricably linked, and that our current energy posture, which affects national security and climate security, is unsustainable. With the growing Earth population, 6.5 billion and climbing rapidly, with the information age telling those 6.5 billion plus people that there's a better lifestyle to be had and that a key to that better lifestyle is access to energy and other critical resources, the demand is going off the charts. And if we project out business as usual with our current levels of energy efficiency and our focus on fossil fuel, the supply simply isn't going to keep up. The solution set has to start now. Our increasing dependence on fossil fuels means that we are more vulnerable today to those unstable countries around the world who are oil producing that would do us harm. That's where much of the terrorism and extremism in the world originates. So we need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, diversify our energy sources across the board uh, in order to protect our security. We have to recognize that energy security and national security are tied together and are being used by other people in the world, whether it's OPEC or the Russians or the Venezuelans or whomever the next oil exporting country decides that they've got a lever that we don't have. Uh, we have to tie those pieces so that people recognize that we need to do something now. The report points to another crack in America's security infrastructure one that affects not only the military, but also the general population, the fragile and vulnerable national electricity grid. We have a grid in which terrorist actions in certain nodes of this electrical grid can deny electrical power over vast regions of our country for many, many days, even weeks. And we have to recognize this and we have to do something about it. Our national electrical grid is aging and vulnerable to accidents and things that cause communities to lose power. A few years ago, it was a couple of trees that caused the entire East Coast to lose power for quite a long time, and that included some critical military installations. So today we need to insulate critical infrastructure from that vulnerability. At the same time, we need to uh, upgrade, modernize, and make smart our electrical grid so that it can serve the needs of a modern society. The needs of a modern society, as well as a modern military, which relies on that same grid. Key to all of this is the threat of climate change that will present new challenges to America's military, which is today the nation's largest single consumer of energy. So, what steps does the military need to take to provide for America's energy security? The report calls on military planners to make energy choices that don't contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and are viable in the carbon-constrained world of the future. This includes developing and using new renewable sources of energy. There are a variety of um, alternative fuels under development. 
Uh, there are a variety of battery technologies, composite materials, uh, renewable sources from wind and solar. It's one of the largest solar installations in the country is at an Air Force base in Nevada. There's also solar housing at other military installations. There's wind resources, geothermal. And today the military is also adopting small vehicles that run on batteries or hybrid electric that will begin to show us the way in the future of new vehicles. Some of the new sources of energy the Defense Department is considering may be surprising. Today, the United States Navy is looking at fueling their ships with algae produced fuel. And when I first heard about algae as a fuel, I thought, well, that's pretty unique. Of course, on the other hand, that's where all oil comes from originally. But uh, the good news about algae uh, is uh, it's going to be plentiful. It's uh, uh, relatively clean to make. Uh, it burns a little better. It's got a better octane than regular fuel, and it doesn't have to have a new infrastructure to move it around. Also on the agenda is streamlining energy efficiency in combat and support operations. There's no one silver bullet. There's no one magic solution. But I think the number one thing is to be much more efficient in the way we use existing forms of energy. A gallon of uh, fuel to an airplane being refueled uh, any place, doesn't have to be in battle, any place, is $42 a gallon. Uh, a gallon of fuel in Afghanistan's in Kabul is about $15 a, a gallon. Now, that's not too bad, but a gallon of fuel to a forward operating base in Afghanistan is reportedly $1,000 a gallon. On the battlefield, as, as we move to other forms of energy and alternative forms of energy, we're not only going to find, I believe, that we're saving more lives on the battlefield because of the way we're using energy, but we're going to find, too, that we're cheaper. We need to understand how we use energy throughout our society. For our military, we need to understand our carbon bootprint, uh, and that means being able to measure our energy use as well as understand greenhouse gas emissions. You can't manage what you don't measure. The report calls for the Department of Defense to ramp up energy efficiency at all installations, pursue smart grid technologies, and electrify the military vehicle fleet. There's a tremendous opportunity here for the Department of Defense, all of the services, and indeed for the entire uh, country, not just the government part of the country, but for individual citizens to face this challenge and actually turn it into opportunity to create a new energy-oriented uh, economy. It was young people who got themselves a president. It was young people who got themselves a Congress. It was young people who put the environment and climate change on the agenda, on the national agenda. The Obama campaign used the internet to elect a president. Since then, new technologies have become the must-have tools to raise funds, build networks, and generate action. At PowerShift 2009, a climate action rally in Washington, D.C., Former Obama campaign strategists trained a new generation of environmental activists in cell phones, new media, and online organizing. Can they do for climate action and the new green economy what they did for the 2008 election? Each one of you is a walking technological superpower. Each one of you, you have more technology on your person right now than the U.S. government had when it put a man on the moon. Ten years ago, if somebody was walking down the street, and they could move their lips and somebody around the world could hear their voice, that person would be considered a god. That's just you on your cell phone. I want you to understand how much power you have. Power Shift 2009 was the largest youth rally for climate action ever. 12,000 young people from 50 states and 30 countries came to Washington, D.C. in February 2009 for three days of skills building and grassroots organizing. And because this is the first year when both houses of Congress will consider climate and energy legislation, activists called on their representatives to ensure that the youth voice is heard. We need five million green jobs, we need a cap on carbon, and we need at least 35 percent emissions reductions by 2020, 80 percent by 2050. We need to put a moratorium on new coal-fired power plants, and we need strong incentives for wind, solar, and geothermal. And we're not going away till we get it. On the youth agenda, putting Americans back to work through millions of green jobs, repowering the country with 100 percent clean energy, 
ending U.S. dependence on fossil fuels and nuclear power, as well as re-engaging globally to tackle the climate crisis. Young activists returned to their countries and to over 1,000 campuses across America to use skills that work in politics to build the movement that will secure their future. We must recognize the moral magnitude of this moment. This year, 2009, our moment! Who's ready for a power shift? Power shift! Power shift! Power shift! Power shift! Power shift! Thank you! The London, UK-based Ecologist is one of the world's leading environmental magazines. Earth Focus brings you Hell for Leather, an expose on the leather tanning trade in Bangladesh in partnership with Ecologist TV, the magazine's film unit. The Buriganga River runs through the heart of Dhaka, Bangladesh. It is also at the center of a bitter struggle, pitting scientists and campaigners against the tanneries that line the riverbanks. $240 million worth of leather is exported from Bangladesh each year. Much of it is sent to Europe, where it is made into bags, belts and shoes for high street shops. Experts claim the tanneries in Dakar that supply much of this leather are killing the river and poisoning tens of thousands of people who live and work nearby. The ecologist visited Bangladesh to investigate these claims. They claim that the principal source of the pollution are the tannery chemicals. Burigong River is mostly polluted by the Hazari Bag tannery. You know, they almost uh, use 300 chemicals, and majority of them toxic chemicals. Untreated tannery effluent fills the stagnant drains around Hazaribha, and the stench of chemicals is overwhelming. Shababa lives on the river nearby. Bangladeshi scientists estimate that one million people could be affected by the chemicals in Hazaribar from washing in the river and eating food contaminated with the polluted water. They allege that these problems include chronic breathing difficulties, skin diseases and internal organ damage. The drains that empty into the river lead straight back to the tanneries. They use around 50 tons of chemicals a day. All of the effluent is released into the drains without any kind of treatment. Research carried out by the Bangladesh Society for Environment and Human Development has found that most tannery workers in Dakar suffer from chemical-related diseases. It estimates that 90% of them will be dead by the age of 50. We gained access to two tanneries that export to the EU. Workers without gloves or shoes can be seen wading in hazardous liquids. When we spoke to the tannery owners about the situation, they suggested that the chemicals are safe because they are European. All chemicals we buy from European origin. Which, which customer can provide us the assurance your chemicals is not, you know, the, it's not problem for the environment or it's not problem for the, you know, the health hazard, these kind of things. And we are buying for this kind of chemicals. Mr. Mazakat Haroon is the managing director of Chemtan Limited, a company that sells tannery products manufactured by Clarient far away in Waverley, Yorkshire. 
Haroon estimates that up to 20% of the chemicals used in Hazaribar are made by Clarion. And he believes that these chemicals are safe. Eco-friendly. All products, all of their products are friendly. What, uh, what is the characteristics of them that makes them... They provide the, uh, that is the product safety data sheet. They provide the literature. Every, uh, we find out that this product is eco-friendly, but we, we never test that it is eco-friendly or not. But there are products, but literature says that it is eco-friendly. Right. They so claim the, that, that our product is eco-friendly. Experts in the UK, however, suggest otherwise. I, I just would be extremely surprised if that was the case. Safe is if you understand all the instructions and you implement all the instructions on all those chemicals that you're using. And then you've got the issue of a chemical on its own might be safe, but how it mixes with that other chemical and that other chemical we don't know, and you can be making a very nasty, toxic cocktail. It's not just the ingredients of the individual chemicals that worry the scientists. Dr. Paul Johnston runs the Greenpeace Science Unit at Exeter University. Essentially what you do as soon as you release a mixture of chemicals like that is, is really you're, you're, you're emptying a Pandora's box into the outside environment and it's really almost impossible to predict exactly what is going to happen. We have very little understanding of the behaviour of mixtures of chemicals in a wider environment or the behaviour of mixtures of, of chemicals in terms of the way that they impact upon human health. It is indeed a huge Pandora's box and it's one that should be brought under very, very tight control. According to Haroon's estimates, Clarion sells five to ten tons of tanning chemicals in Hazaribar every day. When approached, however, Clarion declined to comment on the problems in Hazaribar. Clarion also declined to provide us with any information regarding the safety or composition of the products that they export to Bangladesh. For the past seven years, the government has planned to move the tanneries to a new site outside of Dakar with treatment facilities for the chemicals that are used. But only one out of a hundred planned buildings has started construction. In April last month, the Bangladesh government announced that once again, the relocation scheme has been postponed indefinitely. Much of the leather manufactured in the toxic tanneries of Hazaribar is exported to Europe, where it is manufactured into shoes, handbags and wallets to feed the trade in leather goods. Cheap goods are a dream come true for consumers in the West. But for now, the nightmare stays in Hazaribar, Bangladesh. Most people in the industrialized world are never far from a toilet. But more than two and a half billion people in developing countries live their lives without ever finding one. People make do with the bush, the roadside, or whatever there is in a convenient spot. The result? Nearly 5,000 children die each day from diarrhea-related diseases. The problem is not limited to developing countries. Some highly industrialized nations are still dumping unprocessed waste into their water supplies. British author Rose George spent three years traveling the world to look at the neglected issue of human waste disposal. She speaks with earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson about her recently published book, The Big Necessity, the unmentionable world of human waste and why it matters. She examines the questions, why sanitation remains a leading public health problem and why we all need to pay attention. Tell us the answers to those questions. We would probably not be here if, if it weren't for sanitation or the successful treatment and disposal of human waste. Most of our modern cities in the Western world, um, urban historians call them sanitary cities because without sewers, taking away a potentially toxic material because human waste can carry 50 communicable diseases including cholera and uh, dysentery and all sorts of nasty stuff. When sanitation was brought in in London in the 19th century uh, and then followed by hand washing with soap becoming the norm, child mortality which was uh, at that time one in two children died before the age of five so it was dramatic. Uh, child mortality dropped by a fifth. It was an absolutely stunning drop in child mortality and that was due to them figuring out how to deal with the problem of human waste. So that's why it matters. How many children die each year because of an absence of sanitation? Worldwide, uh, the absence of sanitation um, 
contributes to diarrhea. Diarrhea is the second biggest killer of children under five in the world. The death toll from contaminated water and food, which is generally contaminated by human waste and animal waste, um, it's absolutely phenomenal, and yet it is the biggest unspoken public health crisis. Can you put a number on it for children? For there are a few numbers. That there's some debate, but it's around 1.5 to 2 million children a year. Now, that's a child dying, Die. every, dying every 15 seconds from diarrhea, which to most of us in our privileged Western world is simply the result of a bad takeout meal or a, a, a sandwich that doesn't agree with our stomachs. But to children under five, it's an absolutely devastating um, disease. And diarrhea, for example, is the reason uh, that you can have a malnourished child in a well-fed family. And the reason that no matter how much food the child gets, it just continues to leave their body at a great rate and they do not get their nutrients so they can to continue to be malnourished. And this is the result of open defecation? It's a result of the fact that 2.6 billion people worldwide ha have absolutely no sanitation whatsoever. Whatsoever. And when I say that, I mean nothing. I mean not even a bucket or a box. 2.6 billion. 2.6 billion. That's a quarter of the world's population still have absolutely no sanitation. While you were doing your research for this book, did you come across an answer to the uh, solution to the problem that uh, presents itself, an, an obvious one? Well, the obvious solution is that there is no one solution, and that's a new thinking in the in the field of sanitation. Before, there was this concept that the answer to everybody uh, everybody's problems was a wastewater treatment plant and sewers. Now, that d just doesn't make sense for many countries around the world because they simply can't afford to put that much drinking water down a toilet, and they don't necessarily have the expertise to run expensive wastewater treatment plants or the capital to keep those treatment plants going and you do whatever works in that particular situation. That might be in Malawi, that might be um, a composting pit latrine, known as an arbaloo, where you, you have a pit latrine, and then at the end of when you're finished with it, you plant a tree in it, so you get a nice banana tree, because human waste, which is not waste, it's a very good fertilizer when it's properly composted and treated. This horrifying death toll, is this a problem that can be solved just by throwing money at it? And mm. how much would it take? Not necessarily. There are debates about whether it is a money problem. Clearly funding is needed because sanitation is so woefully neglected by donors. Um, water and sanitation in general does not get the money it should. And even when water and sanitation gets attention, often the budget will be 95% going to clean water supply and only a pittance going to sanitation. And yet, it's been calculated that uh, good sanitation, a latrine, can reduce disease by 36% whereas just installing a clean water supply, it's 20%. If you've got the holy trinity of sanitation, clean water supply, and hand washing with soap, then you reduce disease by 80%. So if you give a woman, for example, a latrine, not only will her children probably not die of diarrhea, she will consequently have more time to uh, to work so that income generation is increased. Her girl children in particular who didn't want to go to school because there were no latrines for them and they were embarrassed and scared that they would be attacked or when they were out uh, going to do open defecation, um, they will go back to school. So when sanitation is installed in schools, attendance rates do leap quite impressively, often 20 to 40 percent. Is there an economic sense in this? There is an economic sense. Sanitation is an absolute bargain. It's the most cost-effective health prevention tool we have. Um, it may cost a lot to install a latrine, but in terms of prevention, you reap so many benefits and you save money. If you invest a dollar in sanitation, the World Bank has calculated, you save seven dollars that you would otherwise have spent in health costs and in labor days that you would have lost because your workers are sick with diarrhea or dysentery or cholera. If we want to get universal sanitation for, uh, by 2015, it will cost us $96 billion, but it will save us $660 billion. So the financial benefits of sanitation are simply, uh, well, they're no-brainers, actually. <laughs> it's just such a, such a bargain. There are problems that are beginning to show up in the infrastructure of large cities in developed countries, aren't there, that uh, didn't exist before, problems that didn't exist that are now uh, challenging their ingenuity. Could you talk a little bit about that? 
Um, infrastructurally, um, in the UK and the US, definitely our infrastructure is in, is in a dire state. Um, in the US, the American Society of Civil Engineers in 2005 uh, rated the nation's infrastructure and gave it a D minus. And that was down from a D a few years before. The trouble is that a lot of our sewers were built over 150 years ago. Um, but they built for populations that have simply grown beyond imagination, even in London, where Sir Joseph Basil Jett, one of my particular heroes, who built the main drainage of the metropolis, he built it with a 25% extra capacity because he understood that there would be population growth, but still he built a system for 3 million people which must now serve about 10 million. So there isn't simply the capacity in the sewer network and maintenance is sorely lacking and funding for maintenance is sorely lacking. When they start collapsing, that's when we'll notice. But by then it'll be too late. It'll be very, very expensive to work on it at that point. The time to work on it is now when we can be preventive. So it's by no means just a problem with the developing world. I mean, if you look at the developed world as well, it's quite shocking that, for example, Brussels, which was busy fining other countries, as is its right as the seat of the European Union, uh, didn't install the sewage treatment plant until 2003. So before that, it was simply discharging sewage into the nearest river or sea. And there are other cities that do that too, Victoria, BC. Uh, there is a big uh, debate at the moment about whether they want to install a sewage treatment plant. So the point is we haven't resolved this question. We assume it's been resolved and we assume we have the perfect solution, but we certainly don't. Rose George, thank you very much. You're welcome. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.